Hello, I'm Terry Lindy with Destiny Management and welcome to our Conquer Diabetes program. Today I want to discuss all of the key principles with nutrition and go over basically what our philosophy is with nutrition. So we've worked with many diabetics over the years and non-diabetics, and the principles are going to be the same for both, although they'll be more important for diabetics. Um, the main thing that we've found to have a person be successful with a nutrition program is to make it fit into their lifestyle. So we don't believe that you have to give up any foods. Um, there's better choices to make, and we want to educate you on the better choices and how to apply the principles to your body and educate you on what your body is trying to tell you when you get certain signs and what you need to do when you get those signs. And that way, you'll be able to enjoy a healthy, happy lifestyle, eating the foods that you like without having to give up anything in particular. You might not be able to eat certain things as often as you would like, but in a certain point, you would be able to eat any foods that you do like. So um, as a rule, we like to work with an 80-20 principle. So if you're good 80% of the time, the other 20% doesn't really matter a whole lot. So if you're eating five meals a day and you eat four really good meals, that fifth meal can be kind of your treat or what you would enjoy the most um, again. And there's going to be better ways to combine foods to make that happen. So I want to go over all of the details with that. The first thing that we want to make sure that you're doing is being as consistent as possible. So if that means working with getting three solid meals per day um, versus having to try to get five, let's start with three and build from there. Um, we'll build one meal at a time. And when you start feeling better energy and being able to recover from your daily activities and exercise and all those types of things better and managing your blood sugar. You're going to have less cravings. You're going to want to eat better um, and your body will be working better for you. So consistency is a big part of the whole program and you can work with us as much as or as little as you need on an individual basis or in group settings to get the information that you need to make it work for you. Um, the main thing is always going to be the total calories. And at our website in the member, member area, there are calculators for body fat and calories. That's going to be much easier than trying to do any math. Um, and keep in mind that there are many different formulas out there, but the main thing to, again, be, get, grasp is to be consistent using the same formulas, the same systems to gauge progress. You can't use one formula here and one formula there and compare how things are going. So the calculators will help you get there for the body fat, which you'll need to know to separate your lean body mass and fat mass to gauge progress and to determine the correct number of calories per day for your body and activity level at a given period of time. If your activity level changes, your lean body mass changes, that affects your total calories. But to manage your blood sugar and have the best energy possible, getting enough calories during the day is critical. So most of the time, I'm gonna say 90% or more of the time, people eat too few calories for their metabolism. And what happens when you do this is your metabolism will slow down. So the main thing that keeps your metabolism going is your lean body mass. That requires calories to maintain itself. Fat mass does not require any calories to maintain itself. So the more muscle you have, the more calories you burn 24 hours of the day. Less muscle you have, the less calories you burn during the day. So to keep numbers simple, if you're supposed to be eating 2,000 calories per day to maintain your weight, then if you're only eating 1,200 calories per day, your body does not know that you can just go to the store or go to a restaurant and get food and calories. So it thinks that a starvation might be coming. It starts to set up your system to store body fat. So it releases hormones and enzymes or sets up the hormonal system and releases enzymes to promote fat storage. 
it also uses your lean body mass for energy. So it has to make up for that 800 calories somehow. And what it does is it breaks down your muscle and converts that to either carbohydrate, usually carbohydrate, to maintain your blood sugar to make up for that 800 calorie deficit. So when that happens, your muscle is slowly going down and down and down. And as that happens, you're able to burn fewer calories during the day. So now, with 1,200 calories per day, you're usually going to be either getting little nagging injuries like aches in the joints or strains in the muscles, or you're going to be more susceptible to illnesses because your metabolism isn't functioning optimally. Your metabolism has has two parts, catabolism and anabolism. And I don't want to get too detailed here, but basically you're always breaking down cells and building them back up. So that's your whole metabolism. Catabolism is the breaking down, anabolism is the building up. Every seven years, roughly, your body has gone through and renewed every cell in your body. So every seven years, every cell has been broken down and replaced. If you don't give your body what it needs to do this, you get broken down, broken down, broken down, broken down. And that's basically the aging process. A lot of this can be prevented. So the earlier you get started with this, the better. But we wanna get your system getting as many calories as possible to maintain itself and giving your body the right nutrition. So going back to the example, if you were at 1200 calories per day, and your body slows its metabolism down, it's only able to burn 1,200 calories. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. This takes many months or years for your metabolism to slow down. But then when you get sick or if you go out for a big meal and eat um, a lot of extra calories to feel better at any point, now your body has excess calories and the excess calories get stored as body fat. And this is just a constant cycle back and forth. And every year it's harder and harder and you're usually ending up with less muscle and more body fat. So we wanna give your body enough calories to maintain itself where it does not go into starvation mode. This means that the biggest deficit per day should be about 500 calories. And ideally, if you did want to lose weight, in particular body fat, you need a 500 calorie deficit per day to lose one pound of body fat per week. And that's the goal. Now, if you did want to gain weight and maximize as much muscle as you can get, you'd want to go over your maintenance level by 150 calories. So to use the example numbers, if 2000 calories per day is your maintenance level, you'd want 1,500 calories, at least 1,500 calories to lose one pound of body fat per week, which is very realistic and will help you maintain it long-term. If you try and lose weight quicker than that, you're just gonna end up fighting your body and you'll end up going back and forth, back and forth. If you wanted to gain as much muscle as possible in a period of time, you'd want to eat 2,150 calories per day. So just a little bit more. And this gets us to an example. If I don't know if everybody's heard, but a pound of fat weighs more than a pound or a pound of, I'm sorry, a pound of fat weighs more than a pound of muscle. Okay. And that's not true. So a pound is a pound, but there's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat and 600 calories in a pound of muscle. So muscle is much denser. It doesn't take nearly as many calories to make a pound. So that's why you're only going over your maintenance level by 150 calories. Now, if your metabolism has slowed down and you jumped up to a higher maintenance level, you're just going to end up gaining body fat at first. So what we like to do is work with a person and make small adjustments. Um, we need to find out where your metabolism is at first. If you're only able to burn 1,200 calories per day, the first step is to work on getting the spacing and the quality of those calories as high as possible, and then upping them by about one to 200 calories per week. So if you were doing 1,200, you'd go to 1,300 the next week. You'd maintain that. If your scale weight goes up, you keep that calorie level the same. 
If it doesn't, then you'd go to 1400 and so on. And it's a slow process, but it will pick up your metabolism. And ultimately you'll get to a crossover point where you're going to be losing body fat and maintaining or gaining your lean body mass. So that's the first principle to consider. The next is the spacing of those calories. So your body can only handle about 500 calories at one meal to be able to digest it and process it and absorb the nutrients. So if you, again, are taking 2,000 calories per day, you'd want to break that up to at least four meals. If your schedule allows and you can do more, smaller meals more frequently is better, especially for maintaining blood sugar levels. So if you go too long in between meals. Again, your body thinks that it might be starving. So it starts to set your system up to store the next calories that you take in and your blood sugar also tends to drop quite a bit. So to maintain your blood sugar, we wanna keep the calories coming in consistently every two to three hours. Um, you may be able to go as long as four hours, but I wouldn't recommend more than that. On average, that four to five hour mark is as long as you'd want to go before your body thinks that it's going to get into that starvation mode. So if we can break up that 2000 calories into at least four meals, if not five or six, um, that's going to go much better for maintaining your energy and blood sugar. It also prevents spikes in your blood sugar. Because if your blood sugar starts off really low, your body tends to overcompensate and it will raise your blood sugar really high and then it'll drop down again really quick. So it goes back and forth with um, your blood sugar readings. So the more consistent you can get with your meals, the better your blood sugar is going to be able to be managed and stabilized during the day. And the final principle is the ratio of the protein, carbohydrate, and fat. And this, this gets into a little bit more of being able to eat whatever you want, when you want, um, on your choice, but making the best choices. So the carbohydrate tends to stimulate insulin. And there's two main hormones that affect your blood sugar, and that's insulin and glucagon. And they like to stay in a certain level. So when you eat carbohydrate, insulin gets spiked. Now, how quickly that happens depends on the type of carbohydrate. But when insulin gets really high compared to glucagon, insulin's job is to store calories. So it takes those calories out of the bloodstream and stores them as fat, unless there is carbohydrate needed in the muscles, which would go into the muscles for energy. But <clears throat> typically, we're looking at fat. Glucagon raises your blood sugar, so it has the opposite effect. So insulin lowers your blood sugar by taking the carbohydrate out of your bloodstream and into the um, fat storage or muscle cells. And glucagon takes it out of the muscle cells to raise your blood sugar if it gets too low, and they'll stay in a nice balance. Now, carbohydrate tends to stimulate insulin. Protein and exercise stimulate glucagon. So <clears throat> this is a good tip, if your blood sugar is ever really high, then eating protein and exercise is actually the best, um, is going to be bringing your blood sugar back down into a more of a normal range. So if you're going to be eating a carbohydrate that you know isn't necessarily the best choice and is going to spike your insulin, you can counter that to a large degree by eating protein with it. And typically you'd want to go with your protein first, so that'll stimulate the glucagon, and then you'll eat your carbohydrate. When the glucagon and insulin stay in balance, you're going to be full and feel satisfied, and you're going to have good energy. So if you eat a meal and you feel really tired and groggy after it, that's because too much insulin has been released at that meal. And you want to look at the amount of the protein compared to the carbohydrate and make adjustments. And that's what working with you one-on-one -on -one over the next few weeks is going to allow us to do is get to the right ratio for you. But protein, carbohydrate, and then fat. And fat slows the absorption of the carbohydrate. So if you took a high glycemic food, like say a banana or a pasta or a potato, something that gets into your system quickly, if 
you match it with the right amount of protein and then with fat, it slows the absorption so it doesn't get in as quick. You don't get that insulin spike. So those are the three main key principles to be focused on and learning what your body's trying to tell you will be able to modify all of those principles to fit you, your body and your lifestyle. And again, consistency is gonna be the biggest key. It's a process, so it takes some time to learn. But without boring you with too much detail at this point, um, this is what we're gonna be focusing on for nutrition. Um, let's get into some questions and see if anybody has any particular questions. Um, and let's see. So why am I allowed to eat fat? Um, I thought fat was bad for me. So there is a difference with the types of fats, just like the types of carbohydrates and types of proteins for quality. So anytime you see or hear the word essential, it means that your body cannot manufacture it. So you have to get it in your diet. Now there's three, two essential fatty acids and one that's conditionally essential. That means that it's essential most of the time in the right circumstances, your body might be able to manufacture it, but most of the time it can't. So there's the omegas threes, sixes, and nines. Those are your essential fats. Most, the sources for those fats are predominantly oils, nuts, and seeds. So those are the fats that you'd want to try and get in your diet as much as possible to change how quickly a carbohydrate enters your system. So combining oils, nuts, and seeds with a meal is going to help that most. Um, and those are the fats that you need to get in your nutrition. So if you're looking at, you know, also, there is the thing is too much fat. So you don't want 60% of your calories coming from fat. But the high end is usually considered about 30%. And of that 30%, 10% can be made of saturated fats, which you'll find in the animal proteins or solids like butter or the fat in red meat. Um, but the other 20% should be your nuts, seeds, and oils. And you should have a little bit of those and a variety that's important at each meal to slow the absorption of the carbohydrate. Um, so we've got what foods are good sources of healthy fats. Again, nuts, um, seeds, oils. Olive oil is a really good source for omega-3s, but you do want a variety because again, you need the omega-3s, 6s, and 9s. Almonds are a good source. Um, cashews are a good source. Um, Low-fat dairy products are good sources of essential fats. Eggs also have essential fats in them, so those are another good area for good um, to get good fats. And another good question, um, a lot of times people are told they should not eat carbohydrates. They have to reduce their carbohydrate intake. So that is typically in relation to your processed and refined carbohydrates. Starches, your pastas, um, potatoes have good nutrients, but they are higher on the glycemic index. Rices, um, white sugar, anything that you'll find in a packaged or processed food. Those are the carbohydrates you should try and eliminate or minimize in your nutrition program. Fruits and vegetables are carbohydrates and those are your best choices always. Um, it's really tough to eat too many calories with fruits and vegetables. And although there are a couple of exceptions for fruits and vegetables that get into your system quickly, which would be mainly bananas and carrots, most fruits and vegetables are low on the glycemic index. Now, your brain, just to keep your brain functioning, your brain works off glucose, which is what carbohydrate is in your bloodstream. Your brain needs 60 grams of carbohydrate per day. Now, the total grams of carbohydrate, protein, and fat are going to be determined by how many total calories you take in for the day or your body needs for the day. But you do need at least 60 grams per day 
to maintain brain functioning optimally. So what you'll find is if you try and cut your um, carbohydrate too low, you'll start forgetting things or um, you're, you won't have as much clarity. You won't have as much focus. You'll tend to wander a little bit more or feel a little bit foggy. So if you do not give your body 60 grams of carbohydrate per day, it's going to break down your muscle. Process is called gluconeogenesis for those of you who like a lot of detail, but it takes your protein and it converts it to carbohydrate, which is your glucose, to help your body function. It's not an efficient process, but that's what will happen. So you want to make sure that you're getting in at least 60 grams per day. Now, if you're not or right on that line, that's called ketosis. Now, ketosis is an incomplete breakdown of fat. So some people believe that your body, if you don't give it enough carbohydrate to function optimally, it's going to have to use the fat, which is true to a point. But if you don't have enough carbohydrate, the fat does not break down completely and you get ketone bodies building up in your system. So that's where ketosis happens right at that level. And there's ways to test for this, but Ideally, you're going to be getting enough carbohydrate to stay away from ketosis. So again, how much carbohydrate you have is going to depend on how many total calories, but you need at least 60 grams per day. Let's see what another question is. So what can you eat if you have diabetes? Um, it's going to be back to, again, better choices, but you want a good mix of protein, carbohydrate, and fats at each meal. Some of the better protein choices are going to be fishes. Deep cold water fish are a really good source for essential fatty acids also, such as salmon, and halibut, but again, a variety of fish. Lean poultry, chicken, turkey, always good choices for protein. Lean red meats. And when you see a label that says that it's 2% uh, fat on a red meat, that doesn't mean that 2% of the calories are from fat. It means 2% of the weight of the product is from fat. So without boring you with all of the math, if you look at a 2% extra lean red meat product, it's really about 30, mid 30 percentage of those calories are from fat. So it has more fat than what you might think. But lean red meat sources every now and then are going to be fine and good for the protein as far as a complete protein. And this gets back again to our term essential. Um, there's essential amino acids, and this is where we get into the difference in the quality for the protein. So a complete protein has all of the essential amino acids in it. And the ones that I just listed are going to give you complete protein. Dairy sources are another one where eggs or milk products. Low fat has about 30% of the calories, again, from fat for a low fat dairy product, but that's a good source of protein and essential fats. Um, without the essential, all of the essential amino acids, a protein is considered incomplete. And that's going to be your veg vegetarian sources. So whole grains and vegetables do have amino acids in protein, but they're not a complete protein. And all that means is your body can't manufacture the essential amino acids. So if you don't give them don't give it the essential amino acids in the diet, it can't use the protein. So it will tend to store those calories as fat. So this is where um, if you are vegan or vegetarian, combining whole grains and vegetables to get a complete protein becomes very important. And that's where working with the registered dietitian we have um, working with us will help because they'll be able to help combine the proteins much better if that fits your case. Um, and then the carbohydrates, fruits and vegetables, always your first choices. Um, whole grain breads and rices would be after fruits and vegetables, and then occasionally having the processed carbohydrates like pastas, white rices, maybe potatoes, whatever you like. Um, if it falls into that 20% range of what eating with your nutrition, you're going to be doing just fine. And then another good question is, um, 
what kinds of foods should you avoid? Main ones are ones that spike your insulin. So high glycemic load foods, high glycemic index, two methods of determining how quickly um, a food enters your system and a carbohydrate. And if it spikes your insulin, those are the foods that you'd wanna keep on your 20% list. Those are your white rices, your potatoes, um, your pastas, um, carrots and bananas for fruits and vegetables, um, as well as any kind of processed foods and sugars, um, candies, sweets, whatever those might be. Those are the ones you wanna try and limit to 20% of the time. And if you have on them, it's just more important to have protein and fat with it to manage your blood sugar. So if you wanted to use, let's say a candy bar for your carbohydrates, um, if you had the correct amount of protein and the correct amount of fat, to slow the absorption of all the sugars in the candy bar and the protein to match the glucagon, your blood sugar would actually stay stable. The glucagon and the insulin are going to be matched. So that's what keeps your blood sugar stable. And that's what you're shooting to do all day long. So that's, again, the importance of getting enough total calories and getting the spacing of those calories every couple hours, two to three hours, and not getting the spikes in the blood sugar from having just one of the food items, say just the candy bar that's going to spike your sugar, your blood sugar, and then knock you way down and make you tired. And another good question is, why do I crave sweets? And that gets into the insulin and glucagon also. It's a blood sugar balance. So if your blood sugar is off, and usually it's going to be too low, your body's going to make you crave things that will raise your blood sugar very quickly. And those are usually going to be your sweets and your candies. So if you always have a craving, it's because your blood sugar is not staying in balance. It's um, out of say out of whack, out of range, it's staying in a low or going high and then going low. If you're eating in a correct ratio that works for your system, your blood sugar should stay at a nice even level all day long, have little fluctuations, but not huge spikes that are going to raise and lower your blood sugar. And learning this takes some time and effort. But once you do this, you'll have it for the rest of your life. Stress, um, lack of sleep, those types of things do affect this. But again, learning your body and what it's trying to tell you, you'll know what adjustments to make when that time comes. So one other thing I should talk about also for blood sugar is the importance of water. Um, if you think about it this way, if you are dehydrated or not taking in enough water, your blood is a lot more concentrated. So your blood sugar stays high. Um, it doesn't allow it to get down lower if it's in a concentrated say form so everything in your body works on pressure gradients if this is a cell membrane there has to be more pressure on this side to get things to transfer across the membrane over here and vice versa if you're dehydrated there's less force to do that so your nutrients gets don't get transferred as efficiently and <clears throat> your blood sugar tends to stay higher. So getting enough water during the day is critical for health. It's your number one nutrient. You can, an average person can live for over a month without food, but they'll die within a week without water. And you're going to need more water than you think. So eight, eight ounce glasses is considered the minimum for the average person, but that's a sedentary person and who does not have much lean body mass. That's for say a 150 pound person. So if you have more muscle, you're more active, you have, you do sweat more during the day, you're not sedentary, your water requirements goes up. So the minimum I like to use is to take your body weight. If you wanna get the most accurate, take your lean body mass, divide it by two, and that's the minimum number of ounces that you would need per day. So if you're a 200 pound person, and we use your total body weight, that means you would need 100 ounces per day as a minimum. Then if you have a caffeinated, 
a carbonated or alcoholic beverage, you add an extra ounce for ounce for ounce. So six ounces of coffee, you get six ex extra ounces of water. You have a 12 ounce beer, you get 12 ounce extra ounces of water. And then to that, you add eight ounces for every 15 minutes you sweat. So if you work out really hard for 30 minutes and you sweat for 30 minutes, you need another 16 ounces of water. So you can see a 200 pound person is going to need three quarters minimum or more than a gallon per day just to maintain their hydration. And here's the thing. So people will say, if I drink all that water, I'm going to go to the bathroom all the time which may be true at first, but that's because you're dehydrated. So your body holds on to water, just like it does to calories in the form of fat, if it thinks that it's starving or if it needs the water. So if it's not getting enough water, your body's gonna hold on to it. That's when you'll tend to um, usually fluctuate on the scale weight more um, because your body's holding on to water and get, getting rid of water, but you'll feel, it, you'll feel bloated and you'll feel kind of um, mushy let's say, um, that's typically going to be water weight. And when you start drinking enough water, your body will flush out the water. So you'll find that you'll have to go to the bathroom about every 15 to 20 minutes. Now, if you keep drinking that water, then your body's going to stabilize and get used to it. And you won't have to go to the bathroom all the time and still be able to drink all the water. When you just a note, when you're going to the bathroom all the time during that period, you're actually getting more dehydrated than if you hadn't drank the water, but it's a necessary evil to get to the hydration state. And just to keep it realistic, it's not realistic to be able to stay hydrated 100% of the time. You're always going to be going back and forth somewhat, but try to get as much water as possible. It really helps stabilize your blood sugar quite a bit. And if you are needing 100 ounces, it's like the meals, you need to break it up because if you took in 100 ounces of water all at once, your body's just going to flush it out. So you need to break it up like eight ounces or 12 ounces per hour and try and again, be as consistent as possible with you, with it. Consistency with the calories, consistency with the water will be the biggest bang for your buck for maintaining and stabilizing your blood sugar during the day. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, do I need to limit my alcohol intake? For health, yes. Um, for blood sugar, alcohol makes your blood sugar fluctuate quite a bit. So it will initially, so there's alcohol is a separate nutrient. There's protein, there's carbohydrate, there's fat, and then there's alcohol. It has calories, so it's adding to your calorie level, but it's not giving your body the nutrients, vitamins, and minerals that it needs um, to be effective. So it's adding extra calories, and ultimately it ends up lowering your blood sugar. So the main reason, main reasons you would have for having a hangover the next day after drinking a lot is because of low blood sugar and dehydration. Once your blood sugar comes back up and stabilizes and you have enough water to get your hydration levels back up, you're going to feel a lot better after drinking, but it does wreak havoc on blood sugar. And again, key here would be to balance the insulin and the glucagon. So if the alcohol is going to lower your blood sugar, glucagon raises it. So a little activity while you're drinking helps stabilize that and then also protein. But alcohol is a poison to your body. So you don't want to consume too many calories when you're drinking because your body processes the alcohol out of your system first since it's a poison and the calories that you take in then tend to get stored as fat. So again, 20% of the time, alcohol is can fit into your lifestyle if you choose to, but it's how you do it. You don't want to, once in a while, if you went overboard, not critical, but one to two glasses is reasonable. Um, and again, if you were looking at a seven-day week, if you had two of those days where you had alcohol, at night, um, it's going to be 20% of the time, and it's not going to make a huge difference. You'll have issues with blood sugar from the alcohol, but you can manage that and enjoy it and still have a very healthy lifestyle. And let's see if there's any other questions here. 
Good one. What should I eat to increase or decrease blood sugar? So if you get to a point where your blood sugar is extremely low, you do want something that gets into your system fairly quick. So that, that could be a candy bar, or it could be a carrot or a banana. Juice is going to get into your system a lot quicker than a food because your body doesn't have to digest it. So having access to something like that, should your blood for sugar fall too low at any point is always going to be a good idea. Um, so that will raise your blood sugar the quickest. If you need to lower your blood sugar because it's extremely high, then light activity, walking is good and be good. Um, stretching will be good, stretching the muscles, any kind of movement or activity, but nothing too strenuous. So um, walking, stepping in place, um, going up and down small stairs, stretching, light activity um, opens your cells to insulin. So a lot of the issues with anybody who has blood sugar problems, whether it's diabetics or not, is going to be an insulin resistance um, where the cells, the muscle cells become resistant to insulin. And we talked about that pressure gradient where there has to be more on this side to transport it across. So if your cells are resistant to insulin, then you have to give your body more insulin to push it across. Exercise increases your cells sensitivity to insulin. So it makes it work more efficiently and more effectively, and that will lower your blood sugar the quickest. So if you get a reading where your blood sugar is really high, light movement, light activity, stretching will help lower that and keep it under control the best. Let's see any other questions here. Looks like we've covered most of that. So I think We'll leave it at that for today. If you, any of you would like to have more information, more detail on your particular circumstance, please contact us anytime. We're here for you. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the program and we're going to get you all the information you need to lead a happy and healthy lifestyle. Thanks. Bye.